greatest form of control is where you think you're free when you're being fundamentally manipulated and dictated. One form of dictatorship is being in a prison cell and you can see the bars and touch it. The other one is sitting in a prison cell but you can't see the bars and you think you're free. free. What the human race is suffering from is mass hypnosis. We are being hypnotized by people like this. News readers, politicians, teachers, lecturers. We are in a country and in a world that is being run by unbelievably sick people. The chasm between what we're told is going on and what is really going on is absolutely enormous. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, you're watching another episode of the Red Pill Hardcore TV show. As always, I'm your host, V. And today, we have a very special guest today. But first, let me start by letting you guys know that, yes, it's true. We have the new uh, t-shirt line <laughs> coming up here. And uh, you get the logo. You can get... Uh, well, actually, either show logo, the show, the show icon. <laughs> That's my guess right there, but we'll, we'll get to him in a second. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, coffee mug, Red Bull Hardcore coffee mug, I'm sure you get it. Hey, I've learned one thing from the West Coast rappers and the East Coast rappers I've had on my show. It's, it's all about the merch. So... Um, <laughs> hopefully we'll have a link to put on the show at some point in time. So, <laughs> uh, without further ado, I have one of the best sources of information in media. Um, definitely one of my esteemed peers. As we're going to be talking, this is going to be an introduction to a series I want to do on my TV show here about the false flag shootings. I have lots of friends in media, lots of talk show host friends. It's just going to be a series because all my friends have covered this issue. Instead of going to their guests, I'm going to have the uh, accumulation of knowledge from all my talk show host friends. And we're just going to do Powwow all, all the way down the line. Because we all have experience with these things, and we talk about stuff nonstop. So let's just get a requiem of the PSYOP and, and get exposed. So, with that said, I have Adam Kokish from Adam vs. The Man. How you doing, Adam? I was saying, brother, thanks for having me on this evening. <laughs> this morning for you in Poland, it's after midnight, it's... It's 625 here in beautiful Miami, Florida. I'm actually uh, enjoying the remnants of, of a great sunset out here uh, from, from the front seat of No Force One. Yes, I heard you honking your horn earlier. <laughs> it's like, wow. Give us the rundown in case my audience doesn't know you. I don't I don't do the whole spiel and uh, you know, just da 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 name drop, name drop. I let my guests toot their own horn, so to speak. <laughs> so well, I, I can't do much of that. You know, it's uh I, you know, it's it, but I will say that I, I have been very fortunate now as someone who I would describe himself as a full time activist for eleven years to have fallen over backwards into such a wonderful position that my fi I find myself in today where I'm running for not president of the United States, rather I'm running for president in order to turn the American presidential election into a referendum on whether or not the federal government should be allowed to exist at all. And in 2020, for the first time in American history, the American people will have a real choice whether to vote for some old party schmuck, red team, blue team, kind of same old crap as always, or something to actually fundamentally different, to vote for freedom, to vote for the dissolution of the entire government, the entire federal government of the United States of America in a peaceful, orderly, responsible manner, leaving us with 50 independent states plus territories plus sovereign 
Native Nations. And this is an idea whose time has come. America has realized we are too good for this government. And not only do we not need to be united under one government to be united in American values, but forcing everybody into this one-size-fits-nobody-but-the-profiteers solution is un-American and anti-freedom. And the sooner we can localize government, get it down to the community level, the sooner we'll be able to throw off this yoke of government entirely. That is, the, the institution. And, and let's be real about what government is. I don't have to tell you this, but uh, oftentimes a lot of these silly debates that have been so colored by propaganda come down to a simple matter of making sure that we're using definitions properly. We're, we're, we're you know, defining words the same way and speaking the same terms. So government is a territorial monopoly on the initiation of force. To govern is to control. When we talk about that institution, it's always at the expense of you, your rights. Everything government does is backed up with a gun because taxation is theft. And how we get out of this is not with a revolution, but with an evolution. And the way we do that is not by fighting over our, deal, our ideal society or communists versus socialists versus conservatives versus constitutionalists versus libertarians. No, 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 none of that. The idea of localizing government unites left, right, and center against the common enemy that is big centralized government. Because when you get government down to the community level, Everybody gets what they want out of it. And it's at that point that it becomes voluntary. Community-based government isn't really government by a proper definition of government. We get government down here in the United States, down at the county level. First of all, we eliminate the federal government. There's going to be a race among the states of who can get dissolved down to the county first. But all we have to do to lead the world forward in freedom as the American people did once with the first American Revolution by overthrowing the biggest empire the world had ever seen, which incidentally we get to do again right now as Americans when we decide that we're not going to put up with it anymore and show the world the way forward in freedom. Because when we dissolve the federal government in the United States, people in the rest of the world are going to be looking at their central governments like, do we really need you? And as soon as you ask that question, the answer becomes very obvious. Absolutely not. Well, the people of the world need governments like we need cancer, <laughs> like we need disease, like we need thieves, like we need plunderers, like we need murderers. No, absolutely not. We can do better with peace, with harmony, with cooperation. And so to answer your question, I was in the Marine Corps. You couldn't tell from the stupid look on my face. You would know as an army dog. And <laughs> yes. what it's like to serve bankers, politicians, and war profiteers. And I say one of the most beautiful things about this freedom movement that humanity is going through right now is that it's being led in many ways by veterans. Because those of us who have been the knife hand of government, the barrel, the finger, the cutting edge, the violent tools of the jerks in suits who don't care about any of us, we are all the more propelled to right the wrongs of the world because most of us enlisted for good reason, for righteous reason, for noble reason. And then we find out the hard way that the greatest enemies of the Constitution that we swore an oath to are not to be found in the sands of some far off land, but rather right here at home wearing suits in Washington, D.C. So when I got back from Iraq, I was there in 2004. I did a tour in Fallujah with the Marine Corps Civil Affairs team. And I got uh, involved with Iraq Veterans Against the War when I came home. And that was my start in full-time activism because I was compelled to atone for, for the evil that I was a part of, that I supported material, materially, substantial, sub substantively, with, with blood, sweat, and tears. Literally. And I see there's so much motivation. And, and, and maybe with, with military veterans, it's a little more obvious. But really, this is it, what we see, you know, more than we are as a movement being led by veterans, we are being led by victims of the state. And right now, there are a lot more victims of government than people who it's really taken care of.
and we are uniting. We are coming together. We are waking up thanks to shows like this. And you got to support independent media, believe, and share this episode. Support this man, V, here. But what, what we see and, and, you know, what I've learned in, in, in my uh, 11 years of activism, it's not enough to be against one war or against the global war on terror or against this policy or that policy or this politician or that politician. No. It's not even enough to be against militarism. You have to realize that at the heart of that is that great force which disconnects us from each other as human beings, fear and violence and control. And the greatest manifestation of that in the world today, sadly, is government. But because so many people are waking up, thanks to your audience, thanks to you, it's only a matter of time before we continue this beautiful human dance forward and arrive at freedom. You've got it. Um, <laughs> very candid, and we know we know we know what the deal is. Like you said, being ex-military is something that gives us that extra sight that people don't get to see. You know, these patches are in uniforms, and you know they might as well say Exxon, BP, or McDonald's. Straight, you know, it's just globalism that we're fighting for. And yep. nobody knows that. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think that's true. I think there's, there's a strong denial of that that is necessary to keep it going. But I think more people know it than don't. And if, so? if I may go back to this, because a lot of people are skeptical about, about how we build a winning coalition in the United States to dissolve the federal government. Of the eligible voting public in the U.S., only 60% vote consistently in presidential elections consistently well under 30% vote in non-presidential elections. That means most of the people who even come out and vote for the president know that it's mostly bullshit. They've seen the Princeton study that says that policy in D.C. Is, is, is insignificantly affected by public opinion. They know. They know. And the people we're up against... You might say is that 30% who vote enthusiastically every single time. They vote like it's their duty as a patriotic American to make sure that some other schmuck from red team, blue team gets up in Washington, D.C. to represent the old parties and their corporate interests at the expense of the people. But even them, they know that something's wrong. But those, that's, that's it, man. That's it. At very most. At very, very most, you talk about the population of, of, of America that really drives statism, that drives government, and it's less than the rest of the world. And I love this. You know, I just got back from Mexico, but every time I've traveled outside of the United States where it's not full of citizens of the empire, people have a much more realistic, honest relationship with their governments. They don't buy the kind of propaganda crap that a lot of people buy in the United States. But even in the U.S., it's just, <laughs> just that 30%. We get that other 30%. If we just get that other 30% to vote to dissolve the federal government, we as the libertarians here are going to have 30 versus Republicans 15, Democrats 15. That's a blowout. And that's if we don't get anybody from the 40% who consistently never vote to come out, but I would wager that the majority of them don't vote not because they're lazy or apathetic, because they know it's a waste of time. It's a kind of, you know, principled non-voting to say, you know what, if this is the best you got, I'm not even going to bother. I got better stuff to do with my time. So, I, I mean, I got to be really optimistic here, brother. Like, we see that, that you know, people are waking up, and it's, it's, it's exponential. You know how it is. Well, well what about what would you have seen? But what, let, let me ask you, though, what about the tweetism? What about the Electoral College? Because, you know, it's this whole thing of let's not... Uh, it, they don't care who you vote for as long as they get to elect who you vote for. So, I mean, I want to talk about how we're going to get you in there, how we're going to get you solid. <laughs> Sometimes I look at this race and, and how, how it's going so far and how ahead of schedule we are, you know... We, getting a huge run and head start. Obviously, I've done three national tours over the last three years, hitting all over 48 states. 
in order to develop the team, the national network, to recruit people to be delegates for this cause. And it's really shockingly easy. Now, just to be clear about this, the, 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 what we have to do to win, if, say, the you know, American population, 330 million, maybe a third not involved in the conversation, not going to vote ever, too young, too old, whatever, that's fine. 220 million people, we got to get this message in front of them. We have to show them, hey, the United States is better off without the federal government. I think, and from my experience so far, what I have learned is that that message in and of itself is a lot like the message of freedom itself. You cannot unsee what you have seen. You don't go, oh yeah, freedom, liberty, nonviolence, respect for individual rights, yeah, free trade, commerce, love, connection, peace, that's awesome. And then go, eh, never mind, let's go back to doing the government thing and pointing guns at everybody to organize society. No, you don't go back on that. And similarly, with this idea of localizing government, you don't go, oh yeah, we should have community-based government, if any. We should get government as local as possible, if we're going to have it. And then go, nah, the federal government of the United States is really good for us. It just, and so we are so far ahead of things right now, because I got arrested the day that we announced. I don't know if you want to get into that story. That's a fun one. Uh, it, yes, yes, I do, but I, I, I have to agree with you on the certain point that, you know, Yes, constitutionally, it's illegal for us to have a federal standing army, especially when it polices us. They act yeah. like they don't police us, but our police have been militarized, trained by the military, and well, so yeah, it's... Many, hold on, you're not, you're not really exaggerating there, you know, because that's <laughs> a line the founders were, were concerned with. When you say that the, the U.S standing army, the U.S. military, which is not only an unconstitutional, really, but an anti-freedom, anti-American idea when the founders were so against any kind of standing army because they favored a militia, and they knew that ultimately the only legitimate defense of a free people is, and also the most effective one, a well-armed population that refuses to be governed by anybody. And, and I, you know, I'm just, I'm so glad that you brought that up because that, that, that really is absolutely critical in this message. And, and that's a big part of who we're up against, you know, the militarists, the people who really believe in that. But I got arrested on January 16th, the day that we announced this campaign as being official. We put out a press release, an email a few days earlier. We filed the paperwork. And within an hour, I was pulled over twice and arrested uh, in a really obvious, uh, you know, situation where the cop, who pulled me over, was intent that I was going to be leaving in handcuffs, violated so much police procedure, violated my rights, violated the Fourth Amendment, you know, a number of different ways. And if you want to go back, you watch the video, it's on all my channels. You know, it's a fun video, it's about 30 minutes long. You can see me while, while the cops are harassing me, that I'm, I'm giving them stickers, I'm giving them copies of my book. You know, hey, have some freedom. It's, you know, if you want to, if you want to be a, a public servant, we want you to serve the public without any politicians in the middle. You know, like, I'm, I'm not anti-cop. I'm anti-being a government cop. You know, obviously, if you really want to work in the interest of the public safety, I want you to be able to do that and be directly accountable to the people. But as I was getting at, because of this momentum that we got from the exposure, from the arrest, we've already got this message in front of so many more people than we ever expected to at this point. You know, and we're going into the, the 2018 Libertarian National Convention. It's very important for us. We're recruiting delegates to make localism part of the party platform, to make a unity statement that shows we're not a debate club anymore. We're a political force. We want to bring Americans together in localization. We have to clean up the, the corrupt leadership at the Libertarian Party, unfortunately. But we also want to get as much exposure for the message of freedom and localization itself as possible. And we used to be looking at this like, well... We kind of want the goal to be that Adam is the presumptive nominee of the Libertarian Party going into 2020 because we, the Freedom Family, have so come in and taken over, and it's, it's embarrassingly easy. You show up with 500 people, you own the party at the National Convention. It's, it's really embarrassing. Empty, sleep, empty slots for delegates, normally in off years, just it, it's, it's embarrassing. I don't know if you want to get into the tactics and all that stuff, but... 
uh, we're so far ahead that I'm thinking the goal really needs to be shifted because this is obviously this campaign has never been about me. It's always been about this lying in the sand. I just get to be the messenger and the person putting together the team and the person saying, here's the approach, here's how we're going to dissolve the federal government. But we are so far ahead. What I see is the opportunity now, if we pull off everything that we want to between now and the convention in June, uh, July 4 weekend, that weekend before, it starts June 30 to July 3rd in New Orleans, we will have introduced this idea of dissolving the federal government into the American consciousness so much that when anybody goes, hey, what about Oprah? Hey, what about The Rock? Everybody's going, what about nobody? Why do we need a president? Why do we need a federal government? And if that's the case, I want it to be the presumption that in 2020, the American people are going to peacefully overthrow the federal government of the United States entirely, and it doesn't matter who does it. Well, you know, I, I want to talk about the tactics, the dirty tactics. And the one thing that I really want people to understand, and uh, something that you mentioned, something I talk about on my show all the time, I have a small little bunch myself. Well, the Red Pill Minnesota Militia. And I've actually had uh, 14 of my boys taken by uh, Homeland. Never to be heard from again. One of them was actually witnessed uh, being killed. Uh, you know, double tap, back of the head. I mean, execution style. Uh, had scouts on this. Followed, followed the van out to the center in itself, uh, the detention center. <laughs> so, this corruption, and, and, and especially when it comes to these false flag school shootings. Now, you have kids hopped up on a psychotropic drugs and I don't know if you're too much in, into the information on psychotronic weapons or any kind of frequency harassment but these kids are forced and pushed to go nuts and do these shootings and I want to mention done military style you're ex-military, I'm ex-military, we know these kids with no training that just get a gun go in and do these clean sweeps that would take a tactical team with such precision. No, Come on. Yeah, multiple yeah, shots. I don't know about that. Well, about that. but you're multiple giving, shots. You're giving, the military, you're giving the military too much credit. You're, <laughs> you're, you're like, you know what I mean? Yeah, there's tactics. Yeah, there's, there's really not like... Shoot up a room full of kids? No, I'm sorry, you don't need military training for that. But at but same time though, multiple shots are always heard from other parts of the building here and there, and there's all these videos of witnesses saying that they've witnessed other people or have seen other or I mean, heard other shots. These videos are being taken down one by one on YouTube. So I mean, uh, uh, the the false flag. The kids being given AR-15, or findings AR-15s, which I think right there is a psyop in itself because that's our number one weapon for defense against the government. They want these things gone <laughs> out of the hands of the people. And, I mean, what do you think about these false flags? What have you learned about it? You know, obviously these are real deaths. Yes. Talking about? I mean, oh, no, no, no. There. False flags doesn't mean people don't die. It's false flags means yeah. that the, the people perpetrating it are the real people. So, I mean, yeah, well, I mean. So, I, so I, when, when you, I mean, you don't talk about, you know, false flag suicides by thousands of, uh, of teenagers who are under the same influence of psychotropic medications as most of these shooters are. You know, you don't talk about false flag drugging and dumbing down of America by, uh, you know, by the pharmaceutical industry, by the government that engineers it that way. And let's say they, let's, uh, so I'm, I'm skeptical here. Okay. And, and, and the reason, the reason that I have not put the time in to study all of these false flags to get into them is I think that even if they are fully engineered, even if they are completely staged, even if they are, you know, the, 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 and I don't want to say the craziest conspiracy theories, but the <laughs> most 
Like the, me. <laughs> you know, the, the most intense, even the theories that say that there is the most deliberate conspiratorial intent, whether it's, you know, plants and crisis actors and mind control devices and all the stuff like that, even if those are all true, the more we talk about them, the more power we give them. It's just like 9-11. Well, my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I agree. I, I, I mean, I, I think it's really obvious. You, I mean, you have to be, you have to be really in a lot of a marrow fantasy land kind of denial to say that the government is telling the truth about 9/11. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I've covered that extensively, and yeah, it's it's a crapshoot job from every angle. Uh, but, but I, I, but I want to give credit, uh, merit to, to to what you're trying to say though about the you know giving attention to it because I tell people, look, they want to take our guns. This is obvious. So either they can, can let us have our guns. You know, when a, a guy goes nuts, as soon as he starts squeezing all triggers, you know, Granny standing, standing you know, across the street can pull her three from seven out of her purse, pop the guy, shooting's over. <laughs> you know, you're all you're already you're already giving them too much power. Too, too much power. Because the excuses, the propaganda, they always try to make things way more complicated. Okay. But in this case, the answer is still simple. If you want peace, you want harmony, don't turn to government. No matter what, do not turn to government because that's turning to violence. That's using violence to solve problems and you never get the solutions that you want. So it, it, the thing about the false flags, whether it's 9-11 or school shooting or Gulf of Tonkin or the Lusitania, you know, or, or the main, you know, whatever it is, you go back in history, yeah, tons of false flags, it is, it is part and parcel with the nature of government that it comes up with excuses for more violence. Correct. But, they're never good excuses. Never. 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 Never are they able to, with the false flag, portray the false reality that, Everybody in Iran wants you dead. Or everybody, every last human being in Russia will not stop until the American empire is fall. No, like, if they can't even do that, they're always terrible, terrible, petty, emotionally manipulative excuses. And if you just can stay in that power of freedom and say no, I don't buy any of your excuses for violence. It doesn't matter. I am not going to empower you as government, no matter what your excuse to exist, because what you are is a violent solution to a people problem. And people problems are not solved by violence. They are always made worse by violence. So even to, to, to the time that you spend, now like I know, I know, and I don't mean to, you know, I, I think. It, what, what people who are doing who look at conspiracy theories, who look at shootings, who are analyzing, who are looking behind the curtain, I think that's important. I think that's a good first step. That's a lot better than watching Dancing with the Stars, obviously. But I would challenge you to step back for a second and say, what, why am I really doing this? And for me, it's always, how do we move humanity forward? How do we make life better? for as many people as possible. And that comes from waking people up at a deeper level, from getting people to see the bigger solutions, from empowering people to be active in their communities, to take charge in their governance, whether it's at the community, the state, or the federal level, whatever it is, to be engaged. And, and this gun control issue, even the issue of gun control, like, look, let, 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 me, let me break down gun control in, in, in a couple of different ways that are somewhat unique in the realm of libertarianism and it totally in line with libertarian ethical theory, right? I've got to hear First of all, you know, and I did four months in jail for firearm civil disobedience, so I loaded a shotgun two blocks away from the White House for a YouTube video, so I, I, I believe I have a little skin in the game and a little credibility on this topic, okay? I'm, I'm as, in, with today's technology, I am as 
pro-gun as it gets. You know, I want you to have the absolute right to defend yourself. The thing is, pro-gun doesn't mean anti-private property. It means that if you own property and you want to say no guns on my property, we have to respect that right just as much. And if you're going to carry a gun for self-defense, now I don't care what you do on your own property. I don't care if you go out and go shoot ski, have sport, you know, whatever, fine. Care, and with today's technology, you want to carry a rifle on your back, you want to carry a shotgun around town, I feel safer with you doing that than with a cop walking past me with a gun on his hip. So do it. I encourage open carry. I think it's a great thing. One caveat to that. If you are carrying a firearm for self-defense, it is irresponsible to not also be carrying pepper spray and or a taser. That you have that escalation of force available to you. Because the reason we believe in gun rights is because we believe in property rights. I don't need a second amendment. I don't need a right to own a gun. I own myself. I have a right as a human being to own whatever the heck I want and, and do what I want with it on my own property without anybody else interfering. Absolutely. The reason this is, the reason this is important is because we want to preserve and protect. Why do we want people to use firearms to defend themselves? Because we want to preserve and protect human life. So at the point at which we have the technology, and we're very close to this anyway, where you can disable someone completely. Now, maybe pepper spray tasers aren't quite there. Cool, but when we have the technology, Star Trek style, right? Set phaser to stun. You can, you know, right? You can, you can shoot. Would you rather have a gun, a firearm, or a phaser that if you shoot someone in the pinky toe, it still disables them and freezes them, but it doesn't do any damage to their body? Because what if, what if the person, you know, and you have, I, you have the absolute right to defend yourself when you're being threatened forcefully. You decide. How you're going to, how to defend yourself, how you see fit, that's up to you. But my preference and the market preference is for preservation, not destruction of value. So at the point at which we have that phaser gun, guns are going to be obsolete. In that sense, I'm anti-gun. You know, I, I, I would say once we have that technology, I'm not going to let you carry a handgun, firearm, on, on my, my private property, property for self-defense. At that point, that makes me feel less safe than the readily available alternative. So then when it comes to the policy about guns in general society, say there are people who really just want to live in a gun-free community, right? They want on their private property, they want to be surrounded by other people with private property who feel the same way. They don't want guns on their property. They don't want guns in their community. You have to respect that as a libertarian and say, okay, if you all come together on private property, that's fine. Your rules. You can have a gun-free zone. I'm not going to help you keep a gun, man. You're on your own. You know, you're on your own for security there. But if you want that, I don't have a right to say, no, you have to let me carry a gun on the streets in your community. No, I have to respect your right to self-determination on the community level. And this is why localization is how we move people forward, how we unite everyone. Left, right, and center against the common enemy of big centralized government by respecting those rights. So if you start arguing about guns because there was a shooting, I hate to say it, but you're as much a sucker for the propaganda as the people who want to go vote red team, blue team, because you are missing the bigger opportunity that will move humanity past it. Arguing about guns, yes, it's a fundamental issue. Yes, of course, it's essential to understanding what is government as a coercive entity, what it means to have that check on power that ultimately a people are well-armed and refuse to be governed by anyone. Absolutely. How we move people forward is what unites us, not what divides us. And as, as stupid as it is where we are right now in the conversation, the gun issue is a divisive one. And, and it's, it's one, one that drives people, people towards government, government not, not away, away from. from. And, you know, that's the whole point of these false flags. I, I would agree. But the ideals are all great and dandy, but how are we going to get these things done? I mean, I, I got to agree with you all the way, but the idea of... Well, I, let's just say, I mean, I do everything for the kids. I love children, and I want them safe, protected. So, 
how we take all that and protect these children. I mean, not looking towards government is one thing, but until we can get our children homeschooled <laughs> and out of these government uh, clone uh, indoctrination centers known as, you know, public education, um, you know, I mean, I, I want to see some guards at the door. I know the government has... I'm with you there, but you just, you already, like, before you started asking that question, you gave the answer. What is everybody who responds to a school shooting who, by, by arguing about gun rights on the internet, instead went out and convinced one parent to get their kids out of a government run school? Malcolm X, only a fool would trust their enemy with the education of their children. Exactly. <laughs> it's the idea of you teach yours, I'll teach mine. But uh, yeah, I agree. I'm definitely going to be homeschooling my children. But at the same time, I was going to say, you know, we have a bad taste in our mouth, you know, with this whole TSA thing. I think that was done on purpose, them groping little children and, and only hiring pedophiles. And it seems as though, because that, that to me is, is the solution. A guard at the door of the school. Um, no, metal no, that's a band-aid. Band that's, that's a band-aid band on a gaping wound. wound. But, 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 but hear me out. Let me finish. Uh, a, a guard at the door. I, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at alternatives, to, you know, from them taking our guns no, away. No, man. Uh, Even that doesn't work. A guard, a guard at the door, door you, you still get a gun in your backpack, backpack you go shoot, shoot up a classroom. classroom. Not, Not going to stop, stop it. it. A guard at the door, metal detector, one entrance, in and out. I mean, of, of course, you got to have mercy exits, you know. Uh, if if that's the those, victory that's that, that, we that we get out of that, we lose because that's, that's a bigger government solution. solution. And, and now you're, you're educating, educating your kids to put up with the fundamental violation of their freedom on a daily basis that's even more intrusive than locking them in a prison and calling it a government school. I agree. I agree. But I, I, I think we gotta have the band aid till we get the heel. <laughs> I think. No, I no, no. A gaping wound. I, I, it, is a gaping, it, is it is a gaping. It is a gaping wound. What we have with this, you put a band aid on a gaping wound. You make it harder to heal. It is a denial. It is an avoidance of the true depth of the problem. To say that we can, we can address this problem of government and schools and shootings and. With, with, oh, board government. government. I mean, I really, mean, come on, you know, but let me, let me just stop you for a second. Your answer, I'm just going to, I'm going to put, I'm going to put you on the spot with this. Your answer to a problem created by government is more governments? Well, no, not necessarily. Uh, community, you know, just like you vote a sheriff into office, a community trusted custodian, they're, you know, for, the protection doesn't have to be government. I mean, there's always private security companies, these things like that. There's always someone that can be held liable. I mean, they're, I mean they're I would, a job. So, and I use those to support government education camps. So, so, so now it's worse. Now, no, 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 no. We're going we're gonna to compromise the private sector and our communities and use our communities and private sector resources to support government institutions? But, but, but my point being, I know, I see the greater evil, but not everyone's just going to pull out their children out of schools tomorrow. Not everybody's going to do it. It's not, it's not possible. Nobody's going to do it. So, the really? point being, I, I, I really I, wish, I really wish everyone would. Trust me. Well, okay, so you <laughs> asked, so, so well, v, 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 let me, because you asked how. You asked how, okay? How, how do we and, implement and these ideas? Okay. 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 Localization. When, when it comes to the nuts and bolts of my campaign, campaign it's very simple. simple. I'm going to go in, I'm, when I say I'm running for not president, it's because I'm only going to be president long enough to go in and sign one executive order that dissolves the federal government, that declares it of no authority, that puts it in bankruptcy, essentially, and I'm the bankruptcy agent, so I resign to be custodian of the federal government. Most agencies, FBI, CIA, IRS... Uh, DOE, uh, Department of Education and Energy, Department, uh, you know, all of these these regulatory agencies, that these these counterproductive, harmful agencies, they just get dissolved right away. The useful okay. ones, things like the Department of Transportation, right? Not that complicated. Separate it down to the states. Fifty, all the states already have 
their own departments of transportation. We just have to sign a little paperwork that says now you own those facilities, now you have that authority, now you have control of those personnel, done. Military, you take the offensive weaponry, de-weaponize it, liquidate it. The defensive weaponry, you apportion among the states. The, uh, you know, the agency, that, that's basically it. Every agency is liquidated, localized, or spun off like the VA. You know, this is the, you know, I mean, you know, 20 veterans committing suicide every day. When I went to the VA, when I got back from Iraq and I told them I was having trouble sleeping, I walked out of there with a little brown paper bag, five prescriptions. Three of them had suicide listed as a side effect. Yes. They are killing veterans on behalf of the pharmaceutical industry. There's yeah. no reason the VA shouldn't exist. Give it a pri give it an endowment, spin it off as a private institution in which every single veteran in America gets one ownership voting share on a blockchain and it's open source, clear to the public. You get to vote as a veteran on how those resources are directed. I guarantee you put the VA in the hands of veterans, you're not going to have 20 suicides a day. So when it comes to the, the rest of the liquidated assets, they go to fund Social Security. If there's more than funding it for decades, then we put it into Medicare, Medicaid, SCHIP, things like that, so that the states have plenty of time to come up with something better. You get the federal government out of this right away. Everything gets easier because every American is at least... 30% more prosperous, just relieving that tax burden. You know, and that's that's a real oversimplification because it's better than that. There's so many economic restrictions that are, are consequences of the federal government that we don't even recognize because we take them for granted. But the taxation that is theft at every level of every consumer product being produced, all of the hidden fines, fees, and other costs of government, all of the red tape and regulations, all the businesses that failed or never started because of that, all of that, we get to come up with solutions in our communities that are way better and better customized and tailored to the needs of our communities as opposed to the bureaucrats and politicians in Washington and their sponsors. So when it comes to education, Mark Twain, never let your schooling get in the way of your education. The very concept you know, uh, uh, of, of the Prussian model, cemetery row seating, is not to teach kids. It's not to educate them so much as to teach them how to be obedient, how to teach them to be cogs in the machines. And your answer is to send them through metal detectors with armed guards every day? I don't think so. That is a clear step backwards because the natural state of a child's mind is to be engaged in the world, to be learning, to be assimilating information, to be empowering and more effective. You don't need a school for that. A school kills that. A school kills a child's natural creativity. That's what makes it possible to convince them to enlist in the military. That's what makes it possible to convince them that they need to work some corporate schmuck job to maintain a middle American, middle class quality of life. It's all bullshit. And if you get rid of that, what you do is you really free the potential of a child's mind. You get the federal government money out of education, the, the higher education, all that crap. By the way, I've hired a few dozen people in my life and I have never cared about their education nearly as much as what they've done with it and what they've done with their time on earth. And sitting in a classroom is not something that impresses me. No freaking way. So you get the federal government out of that right away. States are at least able to bring their education systems more in line with the needs of their communities. But ultimately, the goal is to respect children's rights. I mean, you want to say you care about kids? How dare you even suggest that it is an acceptable answer for the government to, at gunpoint, force them into government-run schools and cemetery seating where they're propagandized, lied to, misled, and having their creativity crushed all damn day. No, and it's not homeschooling. The answer is not just homeschooling. You can't just say, well, we're going to take that government curriculum and we're going to remove the social aspect of it and we're going to give it to our kids in the living room. No, absolutely not. It's unschooling. It's allowing a child to guide their own education. That is what every child should have a right to do. That is what I want to see to unleash the power of American future generations, is that we truly respect children's rights and give them the tools to empower them to educate themselves how they see fit, not how uh, the parents, which really means the politicians, which really means their corrupt corporate sponsors, want them to be miseducated. So that's just part of the how, but ultimately, we get government down to the county level here in the United States, we're done.
you know, we're on to the next fight. It's over. You get government down to counties. I know bad approximations for a community, but close enough that at that point, communities can break off. You can break off on your own private property. And that's when we have real freedom. Okay. Well, that's again, all fine and dandy, but not everyone's going to be of the same mindset. And yes, I again, believe in homeschooling and, and raising the children at home. But it's sort of like the Matrix, though. Um, you got to have some people that are a part of the system and fighting for the system because they don't know anything else. They've been indoctrinated. They're going to fight for that. You're going to try to convince a lot of Americans to <laughs> that don't want to raise their kids. Who People probably should have never had kids. They don't want to raise their kids. They'll fight for a public school system so that they can have that reprieve or they're so in love with their work, whatever. You're going to have these people. So what is the solution That's for fine. that? Well, first of all, as I demonstrated earlier with my demographic analysis, uh -huh. we're already way ahead of where the government wants us to think we are that the the, the, their, the government's true base of support in the united states is at most that 30 percent of enthusiastic regular voters and i would say it's even a, a lot less than that probably more like 15 20 percent i mean i go excuse me i've done three national tours of now just the last three years like i said one of the things I'm known for is my Socratic dialogue video. I go to a man on the street and I, and I ask people questions and, and I challenge them to get deeper in their understanding of government. By and large, people are ready for this. You know, I actually watched um, a, 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 there's a favorite episode where you have these two uh, ex Marines, I believe they're ex Marines, and yep. they were protesting in front of, uh, I believe, a hospital where someone was taken against their will. And. Uh, right now, uh, uh, these soldiers, I, these Marines, excuse me, <laughs> were... Uh, yeah, hey, watch it, watch it there. Wow. Ain't ready to be Marines yet. I know what Army stands for. <laughs> hey, I'll never be ready for the Marines. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, yeah, I, I was just like, wow, you know, that just enlightens. It, it's just, you have soldiers. Marines, uh, airmen, uh, uh, seamen, whoever, who have been in there and have seen uh, the crap. They come back home, and I think it's sort of a mafia-like mentality. Uh, they don't want to take care of these veterans because, well, you left the family. You know, you leave the family, it's going to be in a body bag. And so there's that whole um, sort, of, sort of thing there. They don't want to take care of you. We're drugged up. Made to be homeless. I mean, as you said, again, I'll point out, you know, the suicide. Of, uh, the side effect of the medication says suicide. And people you need to understand the reason for that is, well, uh, the drugs don't take away your desire to want to kill yourself. It just takes away all your doubt and bad feelings about killing yourself. But with that said, uh, these are shoved down our throats, uh, you know, the kids and all stuff. I, I, I know Big Pharma is a part of your plan uh, to to make them accountable, I hopefully. Oh, hold on, hold on. You want to talk about Big Pharma? There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an even simpler solution there. Okay, let's see. And you, know this, you smoke pot, V? Uh, no. Oh, you don't? Are you just <laughs> not in the air? Oh, uh, sorry? Marijuana? You just just don't want to say that on the record. <laughs> no, no, I I really don't. I am lethargic enough as is. I try my best to be <laughs> active. I no, seriously, I try my best to be active. I'm I'm very much a nerd. I'm good with uh, waking up to a ball of Mountain Dew and playing a couple <laughs> hours of video games, oh. and I'm and I'm gone. Mountain Dew, Mountain Dew. <laughs> oh, that's, that's poison, man. That's, that's, Five in pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical crap in there. Oh man, you're that's my you're, number one uh, new world order uh, 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 <laughs> NWO poison that I just can't seem to do without. <laughs> yeah, man, you are poisoning yourself. Like, I find, find a healthy alternative. Find, like, you know, whatever. I'll leave you to your own health decisions here. But the reason I asked about marijuana is that marijuana probably saved my life when I got back from Iraq because I didn't take any of those prescriptions. They gave me Xanax as, as needed, and I took a little bit here and there. 
And I was like, man, this is like a bad version of a, of a marijuana high. It's like, you know, just chemical and, and headachey by comparison. I'm like, I, I can't do this. This is how they want me to feel for symptomatic relief. I'm going to be way better off smoking pot than, than taking pharmaceutical drugs. And what's really sad, you saw Donald Trump in the State of the Union just a couple weeks ago saying, we want American patients who are terminally ill to not have to go overseas to, fought, to, to, to pursue experimental treatments. But no mention of veteran suicides, no mention of marijuana. And by the way, marijuana is just a symptomatic treatment for PTSD. It's not a cure. It still requires a form of talk therapy and self-knowledge and talking through a lot of issues. But MDMA, originally developed as a couples therapy drug, you can get two doses of it on the street already now for about 10 bucks each. If it was produced legally, it would be insignificant. And with two therapy sessions two weeks apart, you can cure PTSD in 90 plus percent of patients. And it's illegal because Big Pharma doesn't want that out there. We dissolved the federal government. And by the way, this isn't even to get into the other psychedelics, uh, like, uh, like mushrooms especially. Obviously, ayahuasca, you know, all the uh, different DMT derivatives. So much potential that has been kept from humanity that we are suffering from as a result because Big Pharma wants to keep you sick. We dissolve the federal government. Yeah, it's possible that states might keep some drugs illegal, but at very least, we get a reset on the war on drugs, which is not a war on drugs. It's a war on some drugs. And ultimately, it's a war on privacy in order to enforce it. It's a war on drug users. And since you... I, you know, they use everything. I, they're, they're vice cops. <laughs> what, what do you like? What do you love the most? We're going to use this leverage against you and take everything you got. So, that's, that's government. <laughs> uh, government... In itself, as you said, you know, it's control, but it's government, governing the mind. And if you're governmental, you got a mental disease. So with that said, um, I want to have a commercial break, a pause for a commercial break. <laughs> Hello, I'm B from the Red Bull Hardcore TV show, and I'm here to deliver a message to you. I am standing up and i think you guys should stand up too what are we standing up for clean air the new world governments have been spraying aluminum strontium barium all kinds of nano particulates uh salts heavy metals and we are losing our environment we have trees with aluminum toxicity our wildlife is disappearing one species at a time. We have weather warfare weaponry. If there is anything such as global warming, well, we have ionospheric heaters. That's dramatically bombarding our atmosphere. All this damage can be done to the environment by these nano particulates being sprayed into the atmosphere. We know that it's causing respiratory issues. We know that it's causing autism. We know that it's causing more gallons, the transhumanistic disease. What else is it doing? I think it may just be altering our minds. Watch my movie, and then you decide. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I still am your host, V, this is Red Pill Hardcore, and I have Adam Kokish here from Adam vs. the Man. And so, <laughs> how, how, how do you want me to help? How do I get on this campaign trail? I want it as Adam and V versus the Man. How about that? <laughs> well, we, do have, we are coming through Poland this fall. 
I forget what city in Poland or cities, but I'll be in Poland at some point, uh, I think, uh, late October, November time frame next year. And that's a big part of this because, I don't know, I would imagine there are some people who don't live in the United States who would also rather the federal government of the United States not exist. Just a hunch. We'll find out. So right now, there are kind of two realms to this campaign. And one is... Let's get this message, the message of freedom, the message of localization, in front of as many Americans as possible. And when people say, what can I do to help? I mean, obviously you can donate. If you're a U.S. citizen, you want to donate directly to the campaign, there's a limit of $2,700. That's really the least important thing you can do. You can donate to my nonprofit, my 501c3, that spreads the message of freedom as an educational nonprofit. You can donate as much as you want, no matter where in the world you live. You can become a sponsor of Adam versus the man and just give me money to promote whatever you want to promote. And I use that to put back into my activism. It's one of the dumbest things in American campaign finance law that they try to pretend that there's this like honest restriction of money in politics. Obviously, that's bullshit. But in the case of me and my situation, you can donate to my nonprofit. You can give money to me personally. I can make unlimited loans from my personal funds to my campaign. And as anybody who knows me closely knows, I don't do this for the money. I take very little for myself. I live on uh, 11 acres in Arizona that I bought for $13,000 and I'm building up from scratch. That's the homestead that I want. I'm building an earthship. Everything else, I want to give back to the cause. I feel that that's more important to live in a world. Like, I mean, I, w I want to have kids. I want to raise a family. And when, when we have child protective services and government control of, of, of how you raise your kids, like, I, I just don't feel comfortable right now having kids in America. So for me, in a way, getting rid of the federal government is just sort of feathering the nest. You know, I just want to get the government out of the way so that I can have my kids on my 11 acres at home in Arizona and, and not worry about them getting kidnapped because, you know, I had some friends over to smoke pot on, on the weekend. And obviously, there I don't need to, even need to get into the horror stories there. But whatever that you want to do in that realm of spreading the message of freedom, of waking people up, uh, you know, uh, of getting people on board with localization, I want you to do what you think is most meaningful, most satisfying, most enjoyable, and most sustainable. And everybody as an activist, and an activist is someone who is motivated like I am, by a deep-seated sense of injustice. You cannot just look at the world and see people being hurt and stand back. You see a bully getting in someone's face, you want to get in between them. And, and I think that's what really unites those of us who are working to move humanity forward right now, is that we are activists. And that, there is so much in that. And I know, V, what you are doing with this show, you're not a media producer, you're an activist. You're not here for the money, you're not here for the ego, you're not here for the fame. You could be talking about some other crap you're a good-looking, articulate guy. You want If you want to go mainstream <laughs> and get your makeup done every day before you sit in, a, in front of a camera, you can do it. You're an activist. No? <laughs> oh, well, no makeup today. I'm all natural. <laughs> exactly. So, if whatever it is in that realm, it's all helpful for the cause. Do what you want. If you want to help me specifically get in the Libertarian Party as the nominee in 2020, we are right now organizing the Libertarian takeover of the Libertarian Party. It's been taken over by statists, it's been taken over by Washington Republicans, and it's time for the grassroots to rise up and take it back. And as I hinted to earlier, it is embarrassingly easy to take over the LP. In off years, that is non-presidential years, they have a national convention every two years, most of the delegate seats are empty. So if you can do that, if you live in the United States, and you, know, you don't even have to live in the United States. We're the Libertarian Party. We don't check IDs. But you have to, in some states, you have to be a member. In some states, you have to be a registered voter. So there are some very, very minor hurdles to clear hoops to jump through. But in most states, literally all you need is a name and a pulse. And you raise your hand at the state convention when they say, who wants to be a delegate to the national convention? and you walk to the front of the room, you write your name down, and that's it, you're on the list. And then you show up to New Orleans for a big party July 4 weekend, and you come and help me vote the way we need in order to reform the party, and then be ready to hold that slot and do it again in 2020 so that we can win the nomination then and take this message to a bigger audience and actually put nobody for president finally on the ballot. 
All right, that sounds excellent. Um, you know, I kind of have to take a, a little time out here. I, I want to step this aside. I want to talk about your uh, experience with RT News. I mean, R I love RT. Uh, it's sexual real media, uh, real information media, something I aspire to be, uh, even aspire to be on. But uh, I just have to, <laughs> again, no. <laughs> What's it like? It was, I mean, it was interesting. I think of RT as the, the Russian government, you know, poking the American government in the eye. And I had a TV show there for four months. It was the second version of Adam versus the Man after the, the radio show. And, uh, I, you know, I had a deal with them that, you know, I would only take the show if I had absolute editorial control. And they honored that. They really did. There was, there was only one one disagreement we ever had about anything content related, and it was because on the Chiron, the title that goes across the bottom of the screen, when I interviewed Ron Paul, I wanted it to say, future president of the United States. They said, no, 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 that's one place, you can't mess with our Chirons, that's not your content, that's, that's show, and I was like, all right, but it didn't matter because I was canceled a little while afterwards. Uh, because I was, I was being deliberately critical of Putin, and this, I got canceled right before the big midterm election in 2011 that, that he uh, cheated on so badly and blatantly that I was, of course, going to cover. I think the bigger reason is that the, the, the Russian government, just like every, you know, every American international propaganda effort to cut down foreign powers, the Russian government wants people who offer a counter narrative. This is why they like Tom Hartman and, and Abby Martin, you know, because they, they, are, they are questioning the general narrative. But the problem with those characters is that they're not questioning the nature of government itself. They're not saying what is government. And at some point they looked at me and were like, wait a second. I really need to learn how to do this line in a Russian accent. Wait a second. He's not just against the American government. He's against the idea of government. Wait a second. We can't be paying for that. And so I was, can't, that man, that was a terrible, that's the first time I've ever done that. I don't know if I want you to air that. First time I've ever done a Russian accent in public. But yeah, that's my idea of a terrible Russian accent. But yeah, I mean, it was something like that where they go, nah, this guy's, you know, he's going to be critical. He's going to wake people in Russia up if we keep giving him a platform. Ah, okay. Apples and oranges. <laughs> All right, so back to your campaign trail here. Uh, who... Do you want for your running mate? Yeah. Is, is this going to be an issue or is this a non-issue because you're going to dissolve the corrupt format? I mean, do you have well, someone? It, it, is, it is an important issue because something could happen to me. And I just want to be clear about this. And, and if I may sidebar before I come back to your question, some people uh, object to this campaign. They say, but Adam, that's not constitutional. And I go, yeah. Damn right, it's not constitutional. That's kind of the point. We are invoking the higher authority known as the Declaration of Independence, which says we have not only a right but a duty to alter and abolish systems of government that no longer serve us. And some people will say, but Adam, but Adam, but Adam, what if, what if some Supreme Court justice comes and says you can't do that? What if somebody in Congress impeaches you? What, in the 30 seconds it takes, two seconds it takes me to write my signature? I don't think so, because if the American people decide irrefutably through the American presidential election process that we are not going to put up with the existence of the federal government anymore, no jerk in a suit in Washington, D.C., no congressman, no senator, no Supreme Court justice, not even this jerk in a suit can stop the American people when they have decided something like that. So I tell them, you know, when they say, how can we trust you, Adam? You don't really have to trust me. Because once the American government, or excuse me, once the American people have decided this, let's say I get into office, right, and I go and I swear in, and I go to the Oval Office, and someone brings me the executive order that I've had on my website for months, so the American people, they knew exactly what they were voting on, they bring it over to me, and I go, nah, bring me the dictator for life executive order. Yeah, let me have that one. Shoot me. Just shoot me. I hope you I hope you'd be a little nicer than that. You know, tackle me, put me in handcuffs, lock me up, sure. But no, and anybody, it's like you look at my campaign website, we're gonna be putting together 
when you see the platform, it's really clear. But we're going to have an endorsements page pretty soon here that says, I'm not asking for you to endorse me. I want you to say, I want to pledge. I want you to pledge that you will never support anyone to be president of the United States ever again, and that you endorse this approach of dissolving the federal government in a peaceful, orderly, responsible manner. That's what we're asking for. So for a running mate, it's one of these things where in the American political process, yeah, it's kind of nice that we have this system set up when you're taking on this authority. And I don't, I don't mean to diminish it. When I become custodian of the federal government, I, I'm not going to have, uh, you know, I'm going to have a, a, a tiny fraction, tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the authority that the president would have. But it is a real authority that I'm asking for to be the bankruptcy agent of the federal government. And given the magnitude of that task, I think it's absolutely critical that we have someone to back me up who could fill in if something happened for me. I think it's absolutely critical that we have a whole team of people behind this idea. First, to write the executive order, we're going to need a team of lawyers and policy experts to write it out in detail in a way that's absolutely clear and as legally binding as possible so that when I sign that, we are committed to this process. So there are a lot of people who could do this. And, you know, right now uh, there is someone, and, and, I, you know, I, and, and I'm only going to drop this name because I just got to meet her uh, in, in Anarchapulco, and it was a really beautiful experience. She's a hero of mine. Uh, going back to, to 2008 when she was running as the Green Party nominee for president, going back to what she did when she was a, a congresswoman representing Georgia in the House, grilling Donald Rumsfeld the day before 9-11, about $3 trillion missing, being the biggest critic of the war in Iraq and the global war on terror in Congress during that time, going out to Palestine, going on floats, doing civil disobedience. She truly is a hero, and I had the honor of presenting Cynthia McKinney to the audience in Anarchapulco and to, to bring her back from the 10-year political exile that she's had self-imposed as a result of the threats and pressures and, and just being kept out of uh, every job opportunity that she was presented with in the United States because she was the only member of Congress to truly question the government narrative about 9-11. And that alone makes her a hero to me. So I would be honored. We're a long ways from that. You know, I would be honored if she would be a part of my team. She's already on board with the message. She's already really excited about this. We're talking about it. But, you know, there have been a handful of other names floated. There are a handful of other people who are really interested. And as we gain momentum, it's going to seem a lot more obvious that this is an idea whose time has come. And for now, you know, it would be awesome to have someone like Cynthia say, you know, I'm your running mate and we're going to take this on together because she is just a, an amazing messenger, beautiful person. A blast to hang out with. We had so much fun this past weekend. But, you know, one way or another, we've already drawn the line in the sand. It's just a matter of time. And, and there, there are a lot of great people who, who would help carry this message. She's just a, this, this amazing example. So when the time has come, you know, we'll see when we, as we're building out this team. Um, I, you know, I, would, I, would hope, uh, I would hope that she's up for it. Well, you know, <laughs> if you w would like to add me to your cabinet, for 30 seconds, I can gather up and talk to some militiamen. <laughs> I'll be your sec Secretary of Defense. How about that? For a whole 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> well, well, no, no, and, and, and it's, it's interesting because there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a balance to be struck here, right? You know, I'm, I'm not some major corporate leader. You know, I'm, I'm a successful media producer. I'm a successful author. Um, you know, I've, I've run, uh, you know, a handful of successful, very, very small businesses around those things. I've been on TV, been on radio uh, as a host, but I'm going to need a lot of help. I'm going to need the people who have the administrative experience, the legal experience to carry out possibly the biggest corporate restructuring in, United, in, in human history. Right, because that's what it is. We're going to go from the big corporation, the federal government, to all the subsidiary, cor subsidiary corporations of state and local governments. And and if there's a role for you, brother, like I want you to be a part of this. So we'll, we'll talk offline. But you know, maybe there's some. Maybe you want to be on the, on, you know, part of the VA. Maybe there's a particular part of of, of the, uh, you know, of the Department of Defense that you have some expertise in. You know, I'm really excited that one of the early commitments we got for this, and I was able to say, yeah. 
we can do this Mark Edge of Free Talk Live, great dude who did 10 years in prison, uh, to be the Federal Bureau of Prisons custodian, to be the one saying, oh, all you guys who are here for victimless crimes because our custodial attorney general figured it out, Judge Napolitano, hopefully. Uh, yeah. We're going yeah. to create the way for you to get out of the prison system in a, in a way that's, that's positive for your community, that's empowering to you. And, and so we have Mark Edge committed as our federal, uh, I guess we haven't come up with a, a title, but custodial uh, custodian of the Bureau of Prisons, I suppose, something like that. But he would be in charge of the Bureau of Prisons. So we are building a team, and it really is awesome to have so many people like yourself who just go, yeah, let, let's see if I can find a space in this and, and, and make you part of the team and give you a specific role to say, you know, I'm going to take on this part of the federal government. Well, I'll tell you what, um, I am a director and general of other militia, of militia affairs. So, um, I'm very good with psyopsis and psychological warfare. That's actually the whole point of my show, is I, uh, de or, or declassify that on my show. Uh, all these little scams and, and, and... I want to say just just the mind jobs they put on us because again it's governmental, it's governments, mind control. There's always a scam behind a conspiracy, behind a scam, and most people don't realize these things. You know, you pick up your, your toothpaste and it's just something you need every day, and you realize, oh, it's, it's, well, you learn one day oh, it's got fluoride in it, and it's meant to kill me or make me dumb or or whatever, make me sick. It's, it's, there's something tiny behind everything. Chemtrails and all this. Please, uh, now that I remember the question, how are we going to break down this chemtrail thing? And there's an obvious connection between the American government and the UN. Is UN going to fight back? How? I mean, there are outside influences that have their stake in the corrupt. American federal government. But when it, just first, I want to give you a little the, the the backstory of this campaign, and this goes back to 2012, when I was at Bilderberg with Jason Burmis, the original Info Warrior, and and we were debating freedom versus statism, and you know he's he's an honest guy, he's a small government guy, but he at the and now he's not anymore. He used to be a small government guy, and he said. Oh, yeah? Well, what would you do if you were president? And I was like, what? nothing? Quit? Go home? Get a real job? What do you mean, what would I? I don't want to be president. There's nothing more unlibertarian or anti-freedom you can say than, oh, I want to be president of the United States. So I said, well, I would throw the ring in the fire. What do you mean, what would I? I would get rid of it. I would, I would just abolish the whole thing. And then he goes, no, 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 seriously, what would you do? And, you know, when I started this campaign, I would still say abolish, because ultimately that's the end goal. And you think that abolition, like abolishing slavery, would have the same appeal. But to, to, to be accurate, I'm not truly proposing that we abolish the federal government. We do get rid of it as an institution. We do say that it has no authority whatsoever. But there's some elements, you know, like the VA, like Social Security, privatized, separated from taxation, separated from the violence. They can continue fine. But people started asking me questions. You know, Jason was asking, oh, no, 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 really. What would you do? What would you do about this? What would you do about that? And I had to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa you guys, I'm not even old enough. Like, why are you asking me? By the way, I'm old enough now. This was uh, six years ago. And I was like, okay, fine. I'm representing a worldview. I'm representing a philosophy. I should be able to represent how it's applied. So come on, ask them the questions. And, and there wasn't a single question that we couldn't answer. It, it wasn't easy to answer. And like, I don't mean to diminish the, the scale of the task, but to figure out what is the approach, how do we do this, how do we do that, it's so very easy. There are so many options, you know, but, but really in, in terms of what you do with this, that agency, it's really not that hard. When you're confident in your principles, how you apply them. So to, to get to your question about chemtrails specifically, yeah, you think as a politician, I'm trying to avoid it. No, I just want to set up <laughs> the answer properly. No, chemtrails, uh, okay. geoengineering. Geoengineering. And it's sad because 
this is such a, I mean, uh, there may be some beautiful, legitimate application of this technology. I could be wrong. It might be pure evil. It might yes. be only doing harm. But we don't know because we can't study it in the open because the government is keeping it a secret. And we know that. We know that there are government geoengineering facilities. It's not that complicated. The question about geoengineering is not, is it happening? The question is, how, wide, how widespread is it? And how, who's really behind it? How bad is it hurting us? And what are the motivations for it? But again, if you want to end geoengineering by government in this unethical, covert, destructive, poisoning the air, poisoning the water, messing up the weather systems kind of way, I like to use a little prison analogy, but I'm going to use the clean version this time because I only do this when I'm in prison. I'm not in jail right now, obviously. If you, but you can use your imagination to figure out the jail version. If you have a knife in your back, are you going to stand there and say, well, gee, there's a knife in my back. I wonder what kind of metal it's made out of. I wonder who, who fashioned this blade. Oh, my gosh, look at that beautiful handle. Look at the stones in it. Oh, wow, look at the decoration. Look at the filigree around the pommel. Oh, wow, look at the butt end of the handle. Oh, my gosh. What exquisite workmanship in this knife in my back. No, you say, get it the hell out of my back now. And if you really care about this stuff, I would challenge you to be a little more solutions oriented. Because the more you pour over geoengineering charts, the more you go, well, what's this? What's that? Look at the sky. Look at the contrails. Look at the chemtrails. You're losing sight of the big picture. You're looking at the knife in your back and going, wow, what a beautiful knife. Yeah, you know, that's what I tell everyone. Uh, not in so many words, but <laughs> it, as I tell people this myself, I become looked at as a radical and, and harassed by a government, uh, not just the United States uh, federal government agencies, but agencies abroad. <laughs> and, uh, and it's just... That that sort of thing. So I yes, that's a perfectly you know well point. Why focus on the symptoms when we need to target the disease? So um, one more thing that you touched on, and I just we got to go over this uh, taxation without representation. That's why we had the American Revolution. Well. One of the main reasons why we have the American Revolution. But it's going on today. How many of us pay taxes not having the potholes, you know, fixed in the roads, but we've got militarized police? We're being taxed. Our medical care system is totally abysmal, but yet we're, we've got trillions to go into a never-ending war. It's the taxation. We need to hold our money. If we gotta abolish the, the banking system and start over, we got we gotta do something. I mean, I mean, what do you feel? What do you think about Cryptos. that? Cryptos, cryptos. We're making it irrelevant. We're making, we are <laughs> we're literally making government money obsolete. Buy Bitcoin. Buy Bitcoin Cash. Buy Ethereum. Buy Dash. Get involved. At least understand the basics. Be a competent end user. Put as much time into understanding crypto as you have put into using the dollar. At very least, be able to help further this revolution by taking away, excuse me, evolution, by taking away the power of government money. So on that note, I'm really sorry because we could go all night. This is fun. I, I know we could go all night. I, I, I know you got to go. So with that said, <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you for coming on to the show, Adam. And you're always welcome to come back on. I expect you back on so we can hear the updates on your campaign trail. Yeah, hey, if you would, please, uh, the the next, uh, right now we're going to as many state conventions as possible. We're, we're uh, maybe a quarter of the way through the, the Libertarian Party state convention season right now. That's why Florida, starting tomorrow, is a really big deal for us. And uh, anything that people can do to get involved, please go to thefreedomline.com. That's three words, thefreedomline.com. It's my main website. From there, you can find co-guestforpresident.com. You can find all my social media stuff. You can find everything I got going on. You can plug into our delegate effort 
You can find our national coordinator there. You can find the state coordinator for your state through all that, through the forums at thefreedomline.com. So please get involved that way. Read the book, Freedom. It's free in every digital format possible. That's the one that I wrote to be the ultimate red pill in that format. And because I had a lot of help, I succeeded. So V, the, the, the next critical thing being the Libertarian National Convention, I hope you'll have me on sometime, maybe just before or just after that. Uh, that's July 4 weekend here in New Orleans. So I look forward Absolutely. to you and send something up. Absolutely. And so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Kokish, and I want to encourage everyone to visit those links, show support. And be sure to watch next week's episode. This is the Red Pill Hardcore. I'm your host, V. Catch you next week.